and they have courtship rituals that allow them to determine whether or not um, a male, a female, to determine whether or not a male is of the right species. So I just wanted to show you a little video that shows some of this courtship. This courtship can kind of be rather um, complicated. Um, somebody mentioned peacock spiders. Peacock spiders have really beautiful um, uh, coloration and they use their abdomen um, kind of like the peacock uses his feathers. This is a different example of one. Oops, excuse me. The male jumping spider flirting with a female is a dangerous game. If he fails, she'll stab him with her poison fangs and slip out his insides before he gets any closer he'll have to impress her with a dance she's playing hard to get but he's not going to give up it's time to make his move. He's got to put on his best show to convince her he's a better mate than a meal. For his grand finale, he sings her a song. Spiders don't have ears, but she can feel his vibrations buzzing up through her legs. He casts his spell. And she is mesmerized. Courtship over, the male gets down to business. He produces webs of sperm and inserts them into her genital opening. He escapes with his life, and she is left pregnant with dozens of babies. Okay. So that is reproduction in spiders. So that would actually be another good example of a reproductive isolating mechanism. Remember we talked about courtship, or I talked about courtship as a reproductive isolating mechanism that would keep species separate. So unless the male is and the female are of the right species, they would not be able to respond appropriately. OK, so we're going to finish the arthropods today. So the um, next group are the subphyla crustacea. So remember that the um, spiders were chelicerophormes, and they were in the same group as the horseshoe crabs and the scorpions and the mites. But this is a different group. These are crustacea, and they're called crustaceans because they have a harder exoskeleton than the other exoskeletons that you see like on a spider because they have an exoskeleton of calcium carbonate. And so their exoskeleton is calcified, not just made up of polysaccharides, chitin. So the exoskeleton is calcified, and it tends to be harder and thicker. So the crustaceans include the one that we looked at in lab, like the crayfish, but it would also include shrimp, and lobster, right, and crab. And it also includes one that's very interesting that you might not, if you looked at it, think is related to these, and that is the barnacle. So the barnacle has an outer shell that looks actually very similar to a clam or a mussel. 
they actually adhere to rock surfaces and then they extend their jointed appendages out and they are filter feeders. So we'll look at a picture of a barnacle in a second. So this is just an example of a crustacean, right? The crab, the ghost crab. And then if we look at some other examples, krill. Now I said that krill was what type of organism? What is it grouped as? Because it's microscopic. Does anybody remember? Krill is grouped as a microscopic what? Mm -hmm. It floats in ocean currents, and so therefore what type of uh, floating in ocean currents, what would that be? Plankton, right? So krill are examples of zooplankton. Okay, so that zo means that they're animals, and plankton means they float. And so algae is not an animal, so it is actually phytoplankton. So when you see phytoplankton, so algae would be phytoplankton. And I mentioned that when you look at food, food webs, it's very interesting because you always have at the base of the food web the most amount of biomass. So if we looked at like a, a food web here, where we'd have the phytoplankton down here. They are photosynthetic, so they can capture light energy and CO2, carbon dioxide from the water, right, and put it into chemical energy and they can grow. And then we have the zooplankton on top, right, so they feed on the phytoplankton. And then we might have an, this would be like, baleen whales. Okay. So baleen whales feed on zooplankton. And so when you think about a whale, it's got a huge biomass, right? But if we look at the ecosystem, in order to support that huge biomass, we would actually have to have more zooplankton. So the biomass of the zooplankton is greater than the biomass of all the other animals because they make up the base um, or near the base of the, of the food um, chain. And this is what is referred to as an ecological pyramid. And we're gonna look at another example of an ecological pyramid today, right? And this represents, the size represents the amount of biomass. So if you think about like the mass or the weight of all the zooplankton would have to be greater than the weight of all the other organisms that feed upon them, including whales. So this is a really confusing one to most students because they look at it and they think clam or they think mussel, right? Because it has these two halves of the shell. But what we see here is, is that this is a, um, a crustacean that has jointed appendages. So the jointed appendages kind of take precedence here. And they are filter feeders, so that they actually have these jointed appendages. And you see these, we have them on the Oregon coast, and they're called gooseneck barnacles. So they have this little attachment to the rock, right? And you can go out to the tide pools, and when the tide goes away, you can see these gooseneck particles, they close up and then they will open back up when the tide comes back in. So those are not mollusks, those are crustaceans. So we looked at an example of a crustacean in lab already when we were feeding um, them to the hydra. I'm gonna skip that in a second. I thought I had my crustacean. Oh, here's zooplankton, I wanted to show this. Okay, so this is a diagram that shows some of the zooplankton, and they actually just drew them. And so you can see they're really tiny, very microscopic, and they are very elaborate. And so people who study zooplankton get to see these creatures that have very elaborate jointed appendages, um, and they're just feeding upon, generally just feeding upon the phytoplankton and reproducing. So if we look at the one that we saw in lab, that was Daphnia. So this is a crustacean that we fed our hydra. And so remember that the hydra were the cnidarians and they used their tentacles to paralyze the Daphnia and then they were able to swallow them. 
And so this is um, considered to be a zooplankton, a type of zooplankton as well. So we have scientists that specialize. If you wanted to specialize, you could specialize in the study of zooplankton. Okay. So this is also a crustacean. And what does it look like to you that you might have seen in your life? We already talked about this on Monday. Crawling around in your soil. Okay, this is a roly poly. So this is actually an example of a isopod. Roly polies are also isopods. Okay. So I just wanted to point out is, is that in the ocean, there can be giant isopods, right? This is a pretty big isopod. Remember that the arthropods can get bigger in the ocean because they have the support of the water. So when I was a kid, there was this, this, this big story about this guy who went into the Newport Aquarium and decided he was going to steal the lobster. And he was running off with a 25-pound lobster down the street, and he dropped it. And the shell cracked open, and this poor lobster that was like, I don't know, he was like 75 years old or something, died right on there because um, they can't live out of water. They need to be supported by the water. They're so heavy, right? And also cracking his shell probably didn't help at all. Okay. So there is an example of an isopod that has a very interesting life cycle, and it is an ectoparasite. Kind of, I would say it's ectoparasite because it's kind of, well, it's in the mouth. I'm not sure if you would say ecto or endo. I would say ecto. But this is a um, fish. So this is a bony vertebrate. And this is its parasite. And so these isopods get inside of the mouth of the fish. And they latch on to where the tongue is. And then they subsequently kind of eat away at the tongue so that the fish no longer have a tongue, but they have a parasitic isopod in their mouth. And kind of the interesting thing here is, is that the parasite doesn't want to die, so it actually works like a tongue, so it helps the fish eat, so it serves as a tongue. And it's latched in here to the circulatory system so it can feed up blood and tissue. And so this is, I would say this is an example, kind of like a tick or a leech, where it's an ectoparasite, right, that um, takes over um, and destroys the tongue and then essentially becomes the tongue. And so if you're a fisherman and you open this up, you'll see, you'd see a little creature that has these little eyes right on it. So that's an ectoparasitic isopod. Okay. group in this um, uh, phylum, phylum arthropoda, which means jointed appendage, and remember they're also segmented, are the hexapoda. So these are the six-legged, six walking legs. And so these include the insects. So one of the really interesting thing about the insects is, is that they can be classified uh, based upon their jointed appendages and their mouth parts and also um, the, um, the presence or absence of wings and modification of legs. So when we look at the insects, we see that there is extensive modification of jointed appendages. to serve as mouth parts. Okay. So even their mandible, which is like, we think of it as a bone, you know, it's our lower jaw bone, but their mandible is a modified appendage. Right? They also have these modified appendages called, some of them have called maxilla, which are these little appendages that help to help to feed. So if you think about um, a, a, a grasshopper, for example, it has a mandible, which are chewing jointed appendages. Then it has maxillas that kind of help to move the food. Some of them have sucking mouth parts. Okay. 
right? So like aphids, aphids are insects that feed upon plant juices. And so the aphids are always what come out and like attack your rose bushes or other um, plants. And they um, are, have a kind of interesting um, uh, behavior, the aphids do. So those are the sucking mouth parts. We could also have mosquitoes that have sucking mouth parts. And then we have butterflies. So butterflies not only have sucking mouth parts, but they also have a coiled tube. And so their mouth coils are, it's a jointed appendage that has become a coiled tube and they can unfurl that tube in order to get at nectar inside the, um, inside the um, flower, okay? So what I want you to know is, is that these mouth parts are jointed appendages. They're modified jointed appendages. And depending upon what the organism eats, they're different, right? So if we look at an um, example of this, okay, so these are the mouth parts that we see in the grasshopper. And then if we look at some of the other organisms, this is grasshopper, right? So it has um, the maxilla, it has the mandible. When we look at the um, uh, housefly, it has a mouth parts that are kind of like a sponge. So if you ever saw that famous movie, The Fly, um, that is how they eat. They, regurg they actually um, regurgitate uh, digestive juices. So you can watch them like when they're crawling around on your arm. They actually use this late labella um, as a sponge. And so they're digestive juices right there. And then they're kind of breaking down maybe sweat or something else that is on the surface of your skin as they're walking over you. Okay. And then you can see maybe the different types of um, mandibles, depending upon whether the insect is a herbivore, the insect is a carnivore or a filter feeder. And then when we look at the mouth parts of the mosquito, it's a siphon tube, right? Modified jointed appendages. The, uh, the uh, butterfly mouth parts are a coil. Okay, and then when you look at a cross section of it, you can see that it's a hollow tube that they use to suck out nutrients. The other thing about insects is, is that they have three main body parts. So they have a head, and then the thorax is where the legs and the um, wings come off, and then they have an abdomen. So the abdomen contains holes that allow them to breathe. And so we have spiracles. And these are breathing holes. We'll talk about this more when we get to reproduction. So the insects do not breathe through their mouth. So sometimes you see them and they're like their abdomen's getting bigger and smaller and you can kind of see their abdomen going like this. That is them taking in air, right? And so it would be, the spiracles would be along the surface of the abdomen. This is also where we have the anus, which is at the very tip. And then we have um, copulatory structures too associated with the abdomen. So the female has an ovipositor that she uses to um, deposit eggs. Um, and the males have a, a penis-like structure with, which they use to fertilize the um, eggs internally. So after they're fertilized, the female will deposit them, okay? So that's the abdomen. The thorax has the walking legs and wings. It's important to note um, that the wings are not actually a jointed appendage. There's kind of um, some uh, interest in how wings evolve. They appear to be just an extension of the exoskeleton. And sometimes the wings are really hard and don't have uh, visible bl uh, blood vessels. And sometimes you can see the blood vessels, the nutrient channels inside the wings. Okay. And then the head contains the eyes, the antennae, and the mouth parts. So three main body parts. When we look at spiders, they actually only have two. 
And then crustaceans have many, actually, like shrimp, if you think about it. Okay. Or if you think about centipedes or millipedes, they would have many um, different segments. So this is a fusion of the segments, right? So segments are, have become fused. So many segments have become fused. So now there are only three. main segments of the body. Okay. So I wanted to talk about different types of insect metamorphosis. As I mentioned before, all, all arthropods have to molt. So even like shrimp or even like crabs, they have to come out of their exoskeleton in order to grow. But in insects, we tend to see um, during that molting process, we go from a larval stage, which can be dramatically different than the adult stage. And so we have what is called incomplete metamorphosis. And this is where the larval stage looks similar to the adult. The adult being the stage that reproduces, right? So the adult is what can reproduce. This is as opposed to complete. And this is where the larvae look very different. From the adult. So my favorite example of incomplete, because I think they're so cute, but they're ominous, ominous, sign in your garden are those tiny little caterpillars you know in the spring in the early summer you see these tiny little caterpillars and they look so cute they're like little miniature adults right but if you see a lot of them you know it's going to be a bad year for caterpillars or not caterpillars um bad year for grasshoppers so incomplete would be an example would be grasshoppers so the way that you can tell if a um, grasshopper has become an adult is in their last molt, they'll get wings. Otherwise, um, they are juveniles. Okay, so just each time they get a little big, bit bigger. If we look at some examples of complete, one obvious one would be butterflies. And we also see um, moths. And we might also see um, in here houseflies. and like dragon flies, okay. Okay, so obviously the larva of the butterfly would be the caterpillar, but moths sometimes don't have caterpillars. They could, um, actually they do have caterpillars for caterpillar. I forgot one, I wanted to say beetle. So beetles. So put beetles down there. Okay, so what is the larvae of houseflies called? What? Maggots. Okay, in dragonflies, they're called nymphs. The dragonfly nymphs, and these are aquatic. And in beetles, these are sometimes called, does anybody know? You're digging around in your soil and you see this weird shaped cocoon, or maybe it's a white little wiggly worm It's in the soil. What is that called? Like a white worm. Does anybody know? These are called grubs. Right. So when we look at the advantage to having complete metamorphosis, there is a hypothesis as to why this type of life cycle would have evolved. And this is called um, resource partitioning. 
So this is an example of resource partitioning between uh, larvae and adults. And so what this means is, is that the larvae and the adults do not use exactly the same niche. They're not using the same resources. And so what that means is they're not competing with each other. So they don't compete for access to the same resources. So that's what is called resource partitioning. So if you think about it, caterpillars are herbivores, and they feed upon the green part of the plant. And then the butterflies are nectivores, so they are feeding upon the sweet stuff that the flowers, right? Dragonflies, the nymphs that live in the water and the ponds and the rivers, they're actually feeding upon, um, sometimes they're actually feeding upon small fish, but they feed upon other invertebrates in the water. And then when they metamorphose into adults, um, the adults are carnivorous. So those dragonflies are actually flying around and capturing other flying and, and non-flying insects to feed upon, okay? Grubs tend to be underground, beetles tend to be on top, okay? So this just shows um, how, or what might be a selective advantage if the adults and the larvae are not competing for the same resources that might be advantageous to the population. Okay, so in complete, more, um, complete metamorphosis, we have the pupil stage. Right? And this is where the organism is essentially broken down and rebuilt. And so if you think about it, it's quite amazing that the same tissues, the same even genes that code for a caterpillar are the exact same genes, set same genome that codes for the butterfly, right? So the pupil stage is where we get the formation, you know, the breaking down of the larva. right, and the building of the adult. And that tends to be a stage that is not moving, right? So sometimes you see, you find uh, the pupa of the grub in the soil, right? Sometimes you find the dragonflies kind of pupating on the side of the rock before they've actually become um, adults before, right? And they have to kind of come out of the water and then metamorphose. Okay, so let's look at some examples of these. So this is the uh, incomplete metamorphosis. Okay, so notice that they don't have fully formed wings, right, until they are become adults. So the adults can fly, the juveniles can't. And then if you look at some examples of complete metamorphosis, one that you can see probably in your yard is the, um, the lady beetle. So these are actually not lady bugs in, in the sense that they're not true bugs, they're actually beetles. And so here you can see the pupa stage, actually I think it looks like a little piece of poop, right? So it looks like something you know pooped on the leaf, right? But that's the pupa stage. I'm not sure if they did that on purpose, okay? But the larvae are really weird looking, right? And then here is the adult. So that would be an example of complete metamorphosis in the lady beetle. This is another example. Um, this is the nymph, the dragonfly nymph that lives in water. And the dragonflies, the nymphs live much longer than the adults. So a nymph can live in the water like two to three years. And then one summer, it'll just uh, metamorphose and become the terrestrial dragonfly. And dragonflies don't tend to live more than two to three months. So the larval stage is much longer than the adult stage in this particular group of organisms. Okay. So let's talk about pollination. So this is an example of an ecosystem service. Right? Insects transfer pollen from one plant to another. So they actually allow for the fertilization of the eggs by the sperm, okay? So pollination is the transfer 
a pollen, which is actually, that's E-N, pollen, which is actually sperm, right? From one flower to another, and this is an example of cross-fertilization. Now, not all plants use insects. So if you think about grasses, grasses actually transfer their pollen via the wind. Right? Some organisms use mammals. So there's these uh, big, in the tropics, sometimes it's the monkeys that actually go from one fruiting tree to another and they transfer the pollen on their nose, for example, as they kind of dig around in the flowers, okay? Sometimes it's, um, uh, um, even lizards are pollinators, but pollination tends to be done by insects. So this is an important uh, eco or ecosystem service. And the insect that we rely most upon is called the European honeybee. So this is a non-native bee, but it is very beneficial to use the honeybee because these form colonies that can be transported from one crop to another. So there's a big industry of um, people that actually have honeybee colonies and they transport them on big semi-trucks and they actually move them around the country to fertilize different crops. And one a good example of this is the almond crop in California. Yep. So they come from North Dakota, don't they? Those, those bees, that aren't they delivering them down from, from all over? Yeah, all over the country. So the almonds pollinate, and the problem with this um, method of agriculture is that this is a monoculture, right? So really there's only almonds in the immediate vicinity of where the bees are. And the almonds only flower for a short period of time. So that means that there is no way to like permanently have bee hives just laying around because there's no food for them. So there's only food for them at a particular point in time. And then they have to be transported elsewhere. So it's kind of a problem in terms of um, uh, that you have to bring the bees to the crop in order for pollination to occur, in order for them to get the plants. And so this is a service provided by honeybees. And if you took them away and the almond crop failed, then you could say, oh, well, bees um, economically are worth a million dollars, right? So they provide a service that has an economic benefit, okay? Now, unfortunately, you might have heard that there is a um, problem with European honeybees in particular, and it is called colony collapse disorder. So CCD, I think it's sometimes referred to. And this is where colonies die off. Um, so you have large die off of individuals. You could have colonies moving away from hives and disappearing. Can't you have even queens that just disappear from the hive, right? So the colony collapse disorder is a big problem economically. And so there's lots of scientists, biologists, who are trying to figure out how to, why um, colonies are starting to collapse and how to prevent them. Now, there is a new insecticide that might be kind of one of the problems with the colony collapse, and this insecticides are called neonicotinoids. So what is nicotinoid? Where does that come from? 
nicotine, right? So tobacco actually has nicotine in it, and nicotine is actually an insecticide. But this is a new group of insecticides that they've only recently started using. And it believes, they believe that this insecticide is particularly harmful to honeybees. Okay. So, um, so that could have been a problem. The other problem is that they have mites, right? So sometimes colonies get parasitic mites in them. And then what they have to do is they have to give the, um, the colony a, um, a pesticide. So they actually have to kill off the mites. And what they think is, is that the mites have become resistant to pesticides over time. So mites have become resistant to pesticides. Another possible um, problem that could be causing the colony collapse disorder is, is that they are stressing the colony. And specifically, they feed them high fructose corn syrup. So when they're not able to um, uh, get them to a crop and not have, have a crop that's feeding them, they can give them high fructose, they can give the whole hive the high fructose corn syrup to kind of keep it, you know, um, alive. Normally they would be feeding on their honey, but you remove the honey and you just feed them high fructose corn syrup. And so some people think that that stresses them and it's probably a combination so it's probably a bunch of things that are combining to cause a particular problem. So there was an interesting video or movie that was um, not so recently now, but a few years ago that came out, which was called Queen of the Sun. And I believe you can see this now on like, if you have a Netflix um, thing, but the Queen of the Sun is a video that kind of documents these problems. And so I just wanted to show you the trailer to it because it's kind of an interesting video. It's, it's um, kind of an interesting um, artsy video that talks about that problem. And this woman is actually from Portland. Typical, right? <laughs> she's uh, Sarah Mapelli. She's an artist. She's, she's actually shown some of her art here, but she's the person that puts honey all over her body and then dances with them. So she's the, supposedly the queen of the sun. OK, so this we'll just watch this for a few minutes. The relationship of bees and flowers is one of the most beautiful co-evolutionary relationships we have. Bees are the legs of plants. Beekeepers, they are chosen by bees. You can gross by mistake. If bees left this world, I wouldn't like it because there'd be no honey yeah, and no fruit. Colony collapse disorder is the bill we are getting for all we have done to the bees. If we didn't have bees to pollinate our crops, we'd have to eat just, just bread and oatmeal you know, all the time <laughs> and a couple of nuts. If bees are dying, birds will be dying, plants will be dying. We could call it colony collapse disorder of the human being, too. China's prediction has come true. So many of the problems we face come down to one thing, and that is monoculture. The bees can't even live there. They'll starve to death. From the point of view of nature, it's, it's insane. We've bred a race of super mites with every new chemical we throw at them. Pesticides came from warfare. Of course, they instantly kill the pollinators. When you see an airplane spraying, there's this tremendous feeling of not being able to do anything. I really don't want to lose them. 
I'm really finding out why I'm beekeeping is to keep that going for my children's children. Our very lives depend on beekeeping. The bees sort of let me know, go ahead, we'll help you. Honeybee sanctuaries are springing up like mushrooms in this country. And they're coming closer. Only in the Bronx, baby. Bring them to the Can you see the little antennae? It's lovely. Oh, look at this. Ripping with honey. People say that they can't keep bees. They're lying. <laughs> Okay, so those are the European honeybees. And um, we also have native bees. So it's important to realize that we do have native pollinators that could be encouraged um, and cultivated by creating more diverse cropping system. So some of the native bees that you might have heard of include mason bees. So sometimes people actually have a mason bee little house in my backyard. And what it is, is it's just a piece of wood that you drill holes into. And the mason bees actually will find it and colonize it. And they are kind of good in terms of that they're early pollinators. So they come out like they're the first pollinators kind of out. And then they um, lay there um, larva into the wood and then they pack it with mud and so mason bees are examples of a native bee. We also have things like um, mason bees, we have carpenter bees, oops carpenter bees, we have bumblebees, Some of these are not doing very well, like the bumblebees have a big, are having a hard time because they rely upon open ground. So they actually have a nest that is underground, so it's a hole, right, and that's where they live. The problem with these bees, um, leafcutter bees would be another example. Sweat bees, they're tiny little. Yep. So if you, the summer or the spring, if you find a bush that has bees in it, if you look really carefully, there's not just one type of bee, you might have European honeybees, but you might have a whole bunch of other bees that like might be green or they might be big or they might be tiny little black ones, which tend to be the sweat bees, right? And so the interesting thing about these is, is that they are not colonial. So the problem is, is you cannot take a colony of them. You can't take a colony of bumblebees to a crop, right? However, they are more efficient than the honeybees. So more efficient at pollinating. So they pollinate right? But they require an ecosystem not a monoculture, right? So there are scientists that are very interested in studying native bees and figuring out how we can incorporate them into our food production rather than relying upon colonies of honeybees and moving them around. Okay, okay. so we're gonna take a five, 10 minute break. We'll come back at um, a little bit after maybe quarter after, and then we'll come back and talk some more about, we're gonna move on to echinoderms. So you can get up, everybody should get up and stretch their legs at least. Get a drink of water, walk around a little bit. Oh yeah, do some Pilates, do some yoga.
Okay, are you guys ready to start? So we have two phyla left to go over. So we just finished the arthropods, right? We are now going to focus right up here. And so remember, we're not going to cover some of these, including ectoprocta and brachiopoda. But I wanted to show you that the echinodermata and the chordata, where we are, we're in the chordata, are more closely related than the other we are to the other invertebrate phyla. So the reason for this has to do with embryonic development. So we talked about deuterostomes, right? And how the second opening becomes the mouth and the first opening becomes the anus. And how it's opposite in these groups of organisms. And this actually um, is an embryonic difference that was noted before molecular biology was able to confirm the fact that when we look at molecularly, our DNA is more similar to echinoderms than it is to the other um, invertebrates. So echinodermata, does anybody know what that means? If you were to break it down that word into its roots, what does derma mean? Skin, okay? So echina actually means spiny. So these are spiny skinned. And one of the interesting things about these is, is that they are all marine. So what that means is, is that there's not a lot of diversity in this group. So there's not as many species in this group as, say, for example, in the arthropods or even in the mollusks, where we have some terrestrial um, ad adaptive radiation um, has occurred. Okay. So if we look at examples, this would include the sea star which is commonly called the starfish. It also includes the sea urchin and the sand dollar. So we generally only see the sand dollars endoskeleton, right? It has a skeleton that's endo rather than ecto um, or exoskeleton. And it is the, that's, uh, has spinal, spiny skin in the living uh, creature. And then we have what is called the sea cucumber. So if we looked at why we put all of these organisms together, so we can look at the unique characteristics. Okay, so these organisms are radially symmetric as adults. However, this is a derived characteristic. This is not ancestral because remember that all the other invertebrates that we look at have bilateral symmetry. And even when we look at these guys um, embryonically as larvae, they are bilaterally symmetric. So this is radial symmetry, I'll put here just an arrow. That is a derived, not an ancestral trait. Does everybody understand what that means? It means that their ancestor to the echinoderms were bilaterally symmetric and then radial symmetry secondarily happened. Okay. So with radial symmetry comes a lack of a brain. So when we look at their, uh, the sea star, the sea urchin, they lack as an adult a brain. The larvae actually has a brain. They secondarily lose it and they simply get nerve rings. So as adults, they have nerve rings. So I'll say they lack cephalization as adults. The other unique characteristic is that they have an endoskeleton with spines that kind of protrude out.
Now, their respiratory system is actually on the surface of their body. So if I was to talk about a sea star, for example, they have these spines that protrude out on the surface of their skin. And in between, they have um, these gills. So I'll put my gills that look like this. Uh, gills. Okay. So this is my spine. And this is my skin gill. So the gill is part of the respiratory system. But if you think about it, their, their um, system, their body, would actually sometimes get covered in debris and it could kind of suffocate them, if you can imagine. So what they have are these um, structures that are called pedicillaria. Pedicillaria means little foot, or in this case, a little appendage. And the pedicillaria are really cool. They look like this, and they have, they're like this little structure, and it has like jaws. So it kind of looks like this. And then this would be my skin gland. Okay. So what the pedicillaria do is, is that even without a brain, they go and they pick off the debris that is on the surface of the sea star, and they remove the debris. So these, this is my pedicillaria, these keep the gills clean, okay? So my pedicillaria would be like right here. I didn't leave enough room here, but they would be like right there. It's my pedicillaria around my gills, okay? So that is pedicillaria are unique to echinoderms and then having that spiny skin where their exoendoskeleton is part of the spine. The third thing is, is that they have a new system. So they, we would say that it has a novel system. So when we think about systems, we think about digestive, respiratory. Um, I'm, actually, I don't want to be. Put novel system. Sorry, I want to put that on there. Okay. So that means it's only found in um, echinoderms. So it has to be something that does something other than eat and digest food, get oxygen, deliver nutrients, right? And so this system is what is called the water vascular system. Only found in echinoderms. It is not digestive, circulatory, I'll just abbreviate that, or respiratory. So it's not part of the digestive, circulatory, circ, or respiratory system. So this includes the tube feet. So this water vascular system is open to the ocean water. And so it's actually filled with seawater. And I'm going to I'm going to draw a little picture of my tube foot here. So it has a bulb-like structure. Actually, let me put a little tube coming into it. So it has a bulb-like structure that looks like this and then this would be my tube foot coming down. Okay. So this would be one tube foot. So um, this bulb like structure has these little skeletal muscles. So let me put them in red, like right here, right? So this is muscle. And what the muscles do is, is that they um, compress this bulb like structure, which is called the ampulla. So this whole structure is called the ampulla. And this is the tube foot. Okay. So it works like a turkey baster. If you think about it, you would squeeze that ampulla and the water is going to shoot out. And then what is going to happen is, is that the tube feet is going to adhere to a substrate and it's going to create suction, right? So it creates hydraulic pressure. that is independent of muscular contraction. So the pressure to maintain it does not require
muscular contraction. Right, so the hydraulic pressure does not require continued, so maybe if it does not require continued muscular contraction, because they'll just stuck onto it, right? And so this is why when you're trying to pry a sea star up off the ocean floor, for example, it's really hard to get them up because they have thousands of these tube feet that stick them to the ground, right? So this water vascular system is locomotion. So it's used in movement and feeding, right? So the water vascular system, the tube feet is involved in moving. They move really slow, but they actually have pretty complicated behavior. And then also feeding. So one thing that they feed upon are bivalves. And bivalves, remember, are mollusks, so like clams. So they're able to clasp onto a clam and apply hydraulic pressure until those adductor muscles weaken. And then the clam opens a little bit. And then what the, the sea star does would it would just actually kind of spit its stomach into the clam and digest it and then suck up all the nutrients from the clam. Okay, so I'm going to show you a little short video that shows feeding behavior in a echinoderm. So this is sped up because they move faster and it might take a while. Like an advancing army, the sea stars move into position, slowly but surely working their way up toward their victims. The muscles cannot run or fight. All they can do is hide within their shells as their killers crawl over their bodies. Sensory tube feet sweep over the tightly packed mass of shells, searching for any gap in the muscle's defenses. Settling on its victim, the sea star hunkers down and begins its attack. The miniature camera tucked within the muscle shell gives us the first look ever at the carnage that unfolds here every day. Once the tube feet have physically breached the muscle's defensive line, the sea star's translucent stomach begins the final assault. The animal actually pushes its stomach inside the muscle's shell, unfolding like a fatal flower. The stomach unleashes a volley of chemical weapons, digestive juices that dissolve the muscle's soft pink flesh. All that's left is a nutrient-rich soup, a broth that's quickly absorbed by the sea star. Having assimilated the muscle, the sea star stomach pulls away. And the animal moves on, leaving behind an empty shell. Without the benefit of speed, brains, or brawn, sea stars are amazingly successful predators. So, sea stars are actually really important to the ecosystem, and we're going to watch a video in um, lecture, excuse me, in lab this week um, that looks at um, the significance of the echinoderms in the ecosystem. But one of the really interesting things that has happened recently with the sea stars, specifically on the Pacific coast, 
So like off the coast of Washington, specifically in the San Juan Islands and um, off the coast of Oregon and California, is, is that the sea stars have started to die. And so they call it the sea star wasting disease. And um, what happens is that they just start to kind of turn to mush and their, um, then their legs will fall off. And so there has been recently a dramatic decline in the population sizes. Um, it seems to be maybe getting a little bit better. They've discovered that it is a virus that is doing it, but they also think that the warmer water temperatures along with ocean acidification is also kind of stressing them out so that they're actually more prone to the virus. And that might be why we're having um, a massive die off um, of the sea star population. So it'll be interesting to see what that, how that affects the re rest of the ecosystem. Okay. So we are going to look at just a few other examples of echinoderms. So the brittle stars would also be echinoderms. Generally, when you look at sea urchins, you think of just seeing their um, endoskeleton, and it is radially symmetric. And so it would be like taking the arms of a sea star and kind of folding them over, and you would still see that radial symmetry so that you could cut this animal in different planes to get two identical halves. And then here um, is an example of a sea cucumber. The sea cucumber is really soft, so it's kind of got a reduced endoskeleton with no spines, but it has these rows of, um, rows of uh, tube feet that allow it to kind of move along the surface of the um, uh, coral reef, and they kind of just kind of funnel in food in through their opening of their mouth. Okay. I'll skip through these. Oops, I will talk about that in lab. Okay. So I'm just going to introduce you to the very last phylum, phylum chordata. So remember that these organisms, including us, are deuterostomes. Okay. And so I'll put along with echinoderms. We also have, because of our ancestry, we have a true coelom, right? We have three embryonic tissue layers. We have a complete digestive tract. We are bilaterally symmetric and we have cephalization. So those are kind of terms that we I've kind of repeatedly kind of discussed with you. So those would be ancestral traits. So if we look at the derived traits, what makes the, um, this phylum so interesting is that there are four characteristics. These include the notochord. So the notochord is why this phylum is called chordata. So notice CH, cord, right? And the notochord is a solid rod of cells where muscles attach. Okay. In vertebrates, this is replaced by the vertebrae. So replaced by vertebrae in most chordates, not all, we'll talk about some chordates are not vertebrates. Okay. We have remnants of our notochord and the remnants are the discs that sit between the vertebrae. So the remnants of the notochord are the intervertebral discs. So those discs sit between our vertebrae and they're made of cartilage. And those are what rupture sometimes in us to cause a bulging disc, which can cause damage to the spinal cord or pinching of the spinal nerves. Okay. So that is one characteristic. Okay. The second characteristic is, is that we have a hollow dorsal nerve cord. Okay. 
Notice that's without an H, nerve cord. Dorsal instead of ventral, and hollow instead of solid. So in the other organisms, like in the earthworm, we see this would be versus a solid ventral nerve cord. Right, so when we look at octopus, for example, they have a solid ventral nerve cord. Crayfish, solid ventral nerve cord. Okay, so all chordates have a hollow dorsal nerve cord. The third thing is, is that we have pharyngeal gill slits. Okay, so in some chordates, this is used for respiration and obtaining food. So, and filter feeding. So, for example, in fish, the pharyngeal gill slits are used to breathe, right? Water, oxygenated water rushes into the mouth and then out through the gills, and that's how they get oxygen. Some more primitive ones actually filter food through the use of their gills. Okay. We have embryonically pharyngeal gill slits. So as we develop, we lose those gill slits. Um, some of them uh, become incorporated in our jaw. We actually have a bone that sits right underneath our, our throat. Does anybody know what that bone's called? It sits right here. Hyoid. So the hyoid is actually a remnant support of our gill slits embryonically. Right? So even uh, mammals have gill slits at some point during their um, development. Then the last thing is that there's a post-anal tail. And what this means is, is that the complete digestive system, we have a complete digestive, digestive system that does not run the entire length of the organism. So we have a post-anal tail. In us, our tail is really small, right? But think about cats or dogs, they have big tails. Um, if you think about fish, the tail is actually used in locomotion. So it's important in locomotion in some. So it's important for locomotion in some, i.e., for example, fish. I guess kang kangaroos use their tails quite a bit too. Okay, so I could say, right, that all chordates have these four characteristics at some point during their development, okay? So we'll say, I'm gonna put in a parenthesis here, occurs at some point during development. So really early, all chordates look very similar, right? We have, all have a notochord. In us, it's replaced by vertebrae. Our hollow dorsal nerve cord becomes our brain, which actually has fluid-filled spaces in it. And our spinal cord is hollow. It has spinal fluid, cerebral spinal fluid that runs down the center of it. And then we have the pharyngeal gill slits, which we'll talk about actually become bones in the inner ear and the jaw. And then we have the hyoid bone. And then our tail, postanal tails, are coccyx, which is like um, three or four little bones that sit um, at the end of our um, verte vertebral column. And so the anus, right, ends somewhere before the tail begins. And so in your book, there's a little diagram that shows this image, and it shows what perhaps a very primitive chordate would look like. So this is my... Uh, the digestive, this is my digestive system, so this is my anus, right? This is my notochord. My hollow dorsal nerve cord, it's dorsal to my notochord, right? And then this would be my pharyngeal gill slits. And then the post-anal tail. 
Okay, so those are the four characteristics. Okay, so I'm going to stop there for today. And I will see you in class on, or tomorrow, in lab. Make sure you bring your lab notebooks. You're going to turn your lab notebooks into me tomorrow. I'm going to try to get it to you tomorrow. Okay, so I'm going to try to get you your review sheet also for the... Yes. Yep. So for those of you who missed the first lab, Friday at 12.30, we're going to make that lab up. And then, do we turn this one in? No, I didn't. All right. Just, all right. I just wanted to... Did you turn this one in? No, not yet. Okay. I needed to do the video still. Okay. Great. So is it all right if I, my lab notebook is just like in, in a binder behind my notebook notebook? Or no. Should I try and... You do not want to give me your lecture notes because you need to study. Well, no, like I've got a binder and I keep my notebook in there and uh -huh. I use the binder itself as my lab notebook. Or do you Can want I to install easily... it? look through it yeah okay as long as I can easily turn pages okay. some people try to put like spiral notebooks within a three oh, ring no. notebook and it's impossible for me to turn pages All right. yeah. as long as I can turn pages See you later. I wish I had some kind of arms.